Hey, it's Andrew Cap, otherwise known as that guy who wrote the last Love Attraction book you'll ever need to read, and my new book, Three Words I Use to Sell 100,000 Books. Catch me on The Jesse T Show. Andrew, welcome to The Jesse T Show, brother. Jesse, thanks so much for having me, man. Really excited to be here and wherever we might take this conversation. I am too, man. I'm excited. You know, we connected and, you know, we, we kind of hit it off to a degree and we just really kind of cliff notes kind of got to know each other. And so I want to expand on that conversation. I want to dig deeper into who you are, your story, your journey, and just for some high level overview to kick things off, tell the world a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, what I, who I am and what I do, like what I do has been an evolving thing right now. Most people ask me, I say, Hey, it's Andrew. Otherwise known as a guy who wrote the last law of attraction book you'll ever need to read just because I'm most well known for that in the past two or three years. But um, obviously, I have a new book out also. But leading up to this, I've been a marketer. I've been a copywriter. I've been a marketing consultant. I've been a nine to fiver. Like I've been everything, you know, and in between over the past 20 plus years, um, side hustle, full time hustle, just kind of like moving through succeeding and failing and, and going from there. That's beautiful, brother. So give us give us the way, way back. What was the the impetus to your, you know, your career? What was it that you were called to do? What was it that shaped you? What, you know, what, where did you get some of these uh these tools that helped you to ascend to kind of where you are today? Well, the interesting thing is I remember just getting out of college and I don't even remember the course of the events that unfolded for this specific realization. But after a lifetime of like my elders saying, you know, get a safe job and just work for them forever and you'll be taken care of, I was confronted with the reality like, hey, you know, even if I'm willing to give my all, I haven't really found any company that I can actually depend on like, oh, they're going to take care of me. So I'm like, OK, well, I was kind of thinking about doing my own thing anyway. I guess I have to run my own business because I trust me. I don't know if I trust me to at that point to bring in the books, but at least trust me to take care of myself and make sure I get as much of a raise as possible and all that stuff. And um, I was confronted with this really harsh reality of like, you know, being a young entrepreneur, trying to find, you know, the magic secret to mm -hmm. success and fulfillment which bumped me into a bunch of modalities, one of which being law of attraction, to which when I learned that, I honestly, I kind of viewed it as very inconsistent, very hit and miss, very sometimes it works, but does it really work type of deal. And I didn't realize at the time, well, I was you know, viewing that as inconsistent. It was really me who was inconsistent. And to make a slightly long story a little bit longer, I basically hit a wall four years after learning about the law of attraction where my business imploded and I lost my girlfriend of three years all within the same week, all within actually three days. And when I say lost her, I don't mean, you know, we had a nice breakup. I mean, she like dumped me over text. So it was a pretty harsh reality. I had to look in the mirror and say, OK, something's not working. I wasted yeah. my 20s. What do I do? And I basically kind of looked back and I had this weird simultaneous moment of indignation and epiphany. Like, hey, that law of attraction thing kind of worked whenever I actually stuck with it and yep. didn't stop. Yep. So I said, I don't care what happens, when it happens, why it happens, how it happens. I'm going to stop stopping. I'm going to go all in with this thing. And when I say all in, I don't mean all day, every day, because I knew that was not psychologically sustainable. I mean, five or 10 minutes of gratitude or visualization or whatever methods that anyone's learned through the secret or like yes. whatever law of attraction book they, they would uh, read from. And Jesse was kind of like a movie because two weeks later, uh, my, I feel a lot better than anyone with a broken heart has any business feeling. Mm. Three months later, I'm in a brand new way, healthy relationship. Four months later, I'm making more money than at any point in my life before then. And six months later, everything's different. I'm waking up happy and fulfilled in the best shape of my life. And I learned the hard way and we'll call it law of attraction. But whatever this thing is, it works when you work it. And it wasn't until 11 years later that I'm like, you know what? I want to do something new in my business about a part of my life that I'm excited about and passionate about. Let me give myself permission to do this law of attraction thing. But as evidenced by the title, the last law of attraction book you'll ever need to read, I knew there was like a thousand books out there and there was no point in just adding another book onto the pile unless I was either saying something new or unique or bringing something new to the conversation. Hence, this really bold promise, this really bold intention and um, two and a half years and 100,000 plus copies sold later. Here I am on the Jesse T show. Catch me on the De Jesse T show. That's what you're I'm all here, about. brother. You are here. You are here. You are here. And you're powerfully present. And, you know, there's so much there that that just we are we are in a beautiful age. Uh, it, it's it's kind of odd to say that with all that's going on in the world, but we really are in a beautiful age in many ways. And 
one of the biggest things that's happening from some of these these darker moments in humanity is is we're remembering who we are. And in remembering who we are, th- th- this will kind of get out there for some people, but we are we are creators, we are healers, we're powerful. And this is this is something that by birth, right? Whatever you believe in, God, universe, source, nothing, um, whatever you believe in, we we have these these tools that once we remember them and we own them and we truly believe in them, things like manifestation, intention, things about, you know, uh, creating uh, visualization, things about uh, energy and and how to manage. And we really have this, this power within that for, for one reason or another, and that depending on which rabbit hole, you know, people go down, whether it's, you know, uh, overreach from government, if it's overreach from the powers that be, they, we're, we're depowered. And, and, and what you're saying with the law of attraction and with your journey and, and all these different modalities in that vein of manifestation and having the life that you want, whether it's health, whether it's business, whether it's relationships, whether it's, you know, whatever those things are, we absolutely have the tools to be able to make those things happen. And I know firsthand, speaking from my personal experience, not only myself, but the people that I surround myself with are absolute wizards when it comes to this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And it's, the power of the mind, and, and you could speak to this probably in your studies and in, in your research, but the power of the mind is so untapped. And it's, 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 there's, you know, some, some people say it's like 8%. Some people say it's 12%. Whatever the number is, we're using a fraction of our mind. And that's only on this plane, never mind the other planes that we can, we can play with. So can you speak a little bit to your experience and, and, and whether it's visualization, intention setting, manifestation, some of the tools you started out with and how you cultivated those into stepping into more powerful modalities? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it begins with, like, so me, I've always been very fascinated by human psychology and really fascinated by like the ways by which I have and we get in our way. Yep. And for me, you know, I, I talked about that situation where over six months, like everything changed for me. Part of that decision, it wasn't just like, hey, let me do these methods. And I really mean it this time. It was like, (laughs) you know what? I've been down this road before and that's almost good enough. But what will make it better is an understanding of I have to be very strategic in knowing my own limits and knowing my own ways in which I kind of get get in my own way. And I was intentional about like crafting these testing methods, gratitude, visualization, in a way that works better for me, in a way that makes it easier to do, more convenient to do, more enjoyable to do, yep. to the point that I'm actually looking forward to it. So that rather than it being a chore that I've got to like get through each and every day, it is a choice that I look forward to because Jesse, I've said this before and I'll say it again, I have yet to find like a like a fanatical football fan who goes, wait, Andrew, you mean I have to go to the Super Bowl this year? Right. It's like, no, <laughs> they get to go despite the long plane ride and baking out in the hot sun and all the muss and fuss. They are excited about doing that. So for yes. me, this begins with, well, one, not caring about what the cynics are going to say, like b- being willing to understand, like there's always going to be a cynic. And especially about, like, like, you know, a topic like law of attraction, especially the fact like the secret came out and it was blown up into this fad. And then people are like laughing at it because like now it's an Oprah book of the month deal, like all this, th- these reasons to kind of look at it as a silly thing, rather as looking at it with curiosity, just to see if it works and making your uh, making up your own mind. I was of the focus like, listen, I don't care about the cynics and I am not going to fall for the trap of just doing it for the sake of doing it the way other people instruct. I am going to be very intentional and more importantly, very strategic in how I approach this for myself with the understanding like this stuff, it's kind of like a one size fits all. But by that same token, even when something's one size fit all, you can still wear it your own way. You can choose your own colors. You can choose your own design on your T-shirt, so to say, you know, your your universal energetic vibrational attitude T-shirt. And that's really the perspective I brought to this that I think really helped me along the way. It's energy, right? Like you, you said it perfectly right there. The energy that you you put off, the energy that you receive, the energy you allow yourself to be affected by or, or, or even learn how to manipulate. Uh, and manipulate not, you know, sometimes it gets a bad connotation, but, but make it work for you for the betterment of yourself and others. And, and, and I, I think we touched on this, uh, briefly and, and there's, there's people out there that are, that are doing this at a, at a beautiful level, but really what it comes down to is understanding that everything is energy and everything yes. is really when it comes down to it, it's just a transference of energy. And, and when you can, through whatever methods and means get to a place where you're so clear you're so present and really filled with gratitude and awareness and presence. 
you can really shift things in real time. And I've, I've seen this personally. And, 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 you know, for me, I work with some different things. I work with plant medicines and anywhere from psilocybin mushrooms to ayahuasca and everything in between. And just depending on what I'm trying to achieve or what I'm trying to, to, to heal or to, to call into my life, I've seen some wild shit happen. And I've seen some beautiful things happen in real time, just through thought, just through feeling, just through intention. So we're, we're, we're entering an age, and I alluded to this before, of remembering who we are. We have these tools. And I'll get a little woo-woo here, but these, 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 even for plant medicines, these, these ideas of these healing modalities have been around for eons and, and things that grow in nature, like DMT that is found in our pineal gland and our liver that we exude endogenously when we need to, whether it's, we're on that precipice of dying, like people that see, you know, the white light or they see God or they have this profound life-changing experience. DMT is being released in your, in, in either through your pineal or your liver endogenously, these are things that are found in nature. There's no coincidence that you have something in you that's in nature that we can use together for the betterment of humanity. And mm. things like intention setting in these states. I mean, when you go into a plant medicine journey and you're you're intending something, you can literally co-create with the universe in real time. I've seen some incredible things. And I just want to see from your experience and, and, and when you kind of really get into the flow state and really get into attunement with yourself and your higher self, what are some of the things that you've been able to, I guess, craft, call into your life uh, that, that might seem wild to people, but like they just they just happen for you? Yeah, well, selling 100,000 copies of a book, you know, that in and of itself is, is super wild because I remember when I was researching the new one, I was like, okay, how many books do people actually sell? And I found out like that independent authors, and I'm an independent author, on average over the entire, not the first year, but the entire lifetime of their book, will sell maybe three to 500 copies. That's what came to mind, a few hundred, yeah. Yeah, and and published authors with the big companies, again, on average, because for, for every David Goggins, you've got how many other people that they're on the big label, but you know you never hear he from them. He changed my life, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and, I mean, you know, no surprise, right? Yeah, but yeah. but other people that, that don't fit into that bill, like, but they're still the big publisher, they'll sell two to 5,000 copies. Mm. So 100,000 copies is like this mind-blowing unicorn type of shit. It's like, yep. it just doesn't happen. So for me, sometimes like I I have to like almost pinch myself because I I look at the numbers, I, I see the readouts. I mean, I, I keep track of all this. It's amazing to know that over 100,000 human beings made a decision to put down their hard-earned money, whether it was an audiobook or print or Kindle, whatever, yep. for something that I created. And really interesting, you know, you bring up plant medicine. I Yet, I don't yet personally have experience with it, but what I recognize about it based on my understanding of it is the, the cool thing about that for anyone that goes down that journey, and you could speak more to it because you have experience, is it breaks up the emotional scar tissue, so to speak, of the doubts and cynicism that yep. people automatically have embedded because we were just saying that everything is energy. And I know that you have a, a very intelligent um, base listening to this podcast. So intellectually, we all get that. And maybe intellectually, we agree with it. But we're still surrounded every day by, you know, claims that it's not really that way. Therefore, mm -hmm. we can't help but kind of have one foot in each version of that reality yep. and not really committing. So what if I'm wrong, where, right? Like, what if I'm wrong? What what, what if the, they're right and I'm wrong? Like, that's people's thought in their mind. Like, what, yes. what if this doesn't work? What if, I, you know, how am I going to feel or look like the, the mind and the ego play into it so heavy? And it, that's dangerous for two reasons. Well, one is dangerous in the sense that like people are scared about being wrong because if they go for this and it doesn't work, then they've really lost hope because this really cool thing doesn't feel like a reality to them. And they're, they'd rather be uncomfortable or be miserable than be without hope. So they're scared of that. But the other thing they're scared of is like looking bad. Like they do this in yeah. secret and more power too if you can get your result, but they don't want to tell people because we are genetically predisposed to not wanting to be rejected because there was a time in our life that our bodies still remember that if you got kicked out of the tribe, it was you on your own against that saber tooth tiger. And we still inherently feel that. Yep. So the combination of not wanting to lose all hope or of looking stupid, it keeps us from crossing a very simple, easy boundary of just scheduling five minutes a day for ourselves yep. to go through a simple gratitude exercise or method without even requiring or worrying about the wow, the, the how or the when of whatever result might come, not realizing if only we do that, we might really be blown away with 100,000 copies of a book being sold or meeting the love of our life or yeah. you know solving a health issue that, that shouldn't be solved by today's standards or something else. Okay. 
So I just got chills. So I'm excited. So A, can you talk about the three words? Is that a secret? Or can you talk about the three words that you use to sell a book and also the five minute practice that you implemented to get this moving? Absolutely. And these are two different things. So yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to hedge around the three words. And, and by the way, you know, um, <laughs> too long. If people go on Amazon and they read the preview, they'll actually find out the three words. So it's not like I'm trying to hold it before. So people have to pay for the book. Yep. I do kind of um, hope that people read it to find out the exact words because it's the reveal that helps make the impression. But I will say enough for this. The way the three words are not law of attraction. I mean, this is not a law of attraction. The three words I use to sell hundred thousand books. It's not a law of attraction book. I'll say the three words are basically a way by which you are serving and connecting with your audience to such a point where assuming you are a nonfiction author, you are not only getting them a bigger result than any other competitor got them, but you're getting them excited and inspired enough to recommend you to others. So um, hedging around the three words, it's about giving people, readers, an, um, an impact through your content that most books do not intentionally do because most books not to throw shade at them. Most authors are more concerned with sound, sounding intellectual and smart right. versus giving something useful. Yep. To answer um, your question about methods, I mean, my favorite method um, that I that I used when I was kind of going through this, I call the time lapse method from the last law of attraction book you'll ever need to read. It's very easy. Basically, you're gonna take you're gonna write a list down of 15 things that you're grateful for. Yep. Five five of them are from your past. Five of them are from your present. And five are things that you are looking forward to attracting or manifesting in your future. And they're all written out in the present tense, whether because like, you know, when I'm grateful for my awesome apartment, does that mean that I live there, that I am living there, or that I'm going to get it? You don't know. It's all in the present tense. So you write these 15 things out, five past, five present, five future, and then you jumble up the list. And then in this real jumbled order, you know, maybe a present one and a future and a past, you read through each one out loud or in your mind. And you give yourself 20 or 30 or 60 seconds to just bask in the gratitude of that thing. Beautiful. And the real power and cool, th cool thing about this method yep. is that two thirds of that list, even by the cynical standards of society, it's real. It's true. Meaning the gratitude that you feel for two thirds of that list has a level of certainty and confidence and power and enthusiasm that just can't be faked. But because we as humans don't downshift psychologically very easy, those five future ones that are interspersed will have the same level, whether you believe energetically in the universe or you just believe in the power of your subconscious mind, it will have that same level of power, that gratitude. So you are simultaneously feeling wonderful about what you have, thereby attracting and inviting more and putting a little bit of an extra like, you know, speed boost into the future stuff and helping that come along as well in a very dynamic process that only takes five or 10 minutes. Yep. That's beautiful. Let's talk about some of the mechanics of this and the practicality of it. So for, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming you want to shift your state at some level, at some way, whether it's, you know, uh, it could be movement, it could be smiling, it could be thinking about things and bringing that feeling. Cause a lot of this is bringing emotion and bringing feeling to these, 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 these things to make them more powerful. Because, you know, as, as you said, the mind is so, it's so complex, but sometimes it's so easy too. And and so so if you if you know how to again manipulate that word keeps coming up if you know how to uh, put yourself in a powerful state I will say these things come a lot easier so what are some of those things for you and in, in the methods that you've used in terms of priming yourself in terms of getting into a happy place I mean obviously if you have the birth of a child that probably should bring you to a happy place I'm grateful for the birth of my two sons I am grateful that I beat heroin like I am grateful all these things right. Um, mm -hmm. what, what about for you in terms of specifically getting into a, a feel good state, dropping into that, whether it's through something physical, mental, emotional, what are some things you use? So here's where I'm going to get a little counterintuitive because yeah. some things I do are dramatic and yeah. some things are, aren't what you would classify as a big deal. And I, I can give you specifics, but I want to mention it because one way in which people often get in their own way is they put this false pressure to feel amazing every single time. Yep. Whereas in my own experience, all you have to do is feel a little good. Even if, as long as you don't feel bad, you're on the right path. And okay. the reason I like taking the pressure off is because the less you feel pressure to feel good, the more consistently you actually will feel good and the more opportunities will be open for you to feel ecstatic. So Love for it. me, um, I every single day, I actually um, 
I'll tell you the one method I do every single day that's a combination of methods for my book is I pull out my phone and I leave a five to six or seven minute recorded message of all the things I'm grateful for. And I send it to my friend across the country who then sends his message back to me. Mm. We've installed a nice little easy social pressure in there to keep us accountable, but it's also <laughs> easy to do. And I'm grateful for the good news today. I'm grateful for all my book sales. I'm grateful for my readers and customers and listeners and subscribers and five-star rave reviews of which I've got thousands now. I'm grateful for my health, for my body, for my fitness. I'm grateful for my success and prosperity and wealth and abundance. I'm grateful for my friends and family, every person in my corner. I am grateful for all the people, whether it's UPS or FedEx, or USPS, who actually deliver the books and for Amazon, the people that print out the books. So again, big and small, I'm grateful for all these things. And for me, it's more of like a stacking thing where rather yep. than one huge thing or a bunch yep. of small things, it's just like whatever is comes to my mind in that day. And because I do it every single day, Jesse, I'm so practiced at it that it's even easier for me to access that feeling and get on a roll with all these different things for myself. You start, that's beautiful. And, and I love the, the, almost like the accountability buddy, you get to feel good for them too. And then there's this, there's so much that you just said there. And, you know, there's, there's strength in numbers. Uh, there, there's also, there's a book, uh, if I'm forgetting the name specifically, but it's like the power of eight. And mm. if you have eight people at the same time manifesting and believing and saying the same thing at once, like the, the, the compounding power of that, you could call into things in reality much faster. So there's like a, like what you're doing with your friend across the country that you're supporting each other. You're kind of challenging each other. You're on the same page. So it's kind of like amplifying the effort. Um, and then also you said something about stacking gratitude. And this is something I've used to pull myself out of funks before. Like, so years ago, heard Ed Milet talk about stacking gratitude and he was going through a big depression. And he was like, if you woke up this morning, great. I'm grateful that I woke up. If you woke up in somewhat of a healthy body, I'm grateful for my body. I'm grateful that this, I'm grateful I'm alive. I'm grateful there's, you know, sunshine out today. Like whatever it is, you can start very basic. And I think just the, it's cliche, but the attitude of gratitude, if you have this gratitude about you, like things you, you, you're operating in a different state. Um, mm. and, and, and it's really, it's a powerful state. And like you said, you don't have to like conjure up or manifest almost like a fake feeling. It's just kind of like it's habit. And then the habit itself becomes routine and the routine, you know, you could, you could learn how to get a little bit bits and pieces of happiness out of it. I did want to ask in terms of the practice, right? So I go again, I'm, I'm into biohacking and I'm into augmenting my, my body, mind, soul, spirit, everything. So thinking about the practicality of this in the day to day, is there, is there a time of day? Like, so when you wake up from, from sleep and you're more suggestible and you want to rewire, you know, subliminal, you know, maybe things, is, is it better in the morning, better in the evening? Is it a three time a day thing or whenever mm -hmm. you can do it? Like, what have you seen kind of uh, play out in your life in terms of frequency intention throughout the day, all these things? So there's two answers to that question because there's what works for me personally and then what works for person listening right now. And I want to kind of like deliver across both. Yep. And I'd say this because like, you know, um, intellectually speaking, it's probably most important to do it at the very beginning of the day when you're just waking up or at night when you're just going to sleep because you're closer to the, uh, your subconscious mind. However, I would argue that the most powerful for me or anyone else is really the time of day where it's the e and most convenient because the consistency is the most yep. valuable. Yep. So for me personally, I, so that, that, that message that I leave to my friend, honestly, even though I'm so good at doing this that I don't have to pick a time of day. So I do it. Like sometimes I'll do it the first thing in the morning. Sometimes I'll do it at the end of night. Some like I, the one I left, I did today was like two hours ago. Um, I never know when I'm going to do it. And again, me understanding myself and the way I kind of like the nonsense and the bullshit that I used to get in my own way, <laughs> I'm always finding ways of releasing the pressure valve and saying, all right, listen, I know it's supposed to be better in the morning or in the mm -hmm. evening, but what's like, I'm just going to do what's going to be easiest for me because one, one thing I found above all else is only five minutes a day. It's the daily consistency that really creates the momentum yep. that really gets me to things that I want, that then facilitates more enthusiasm, that then helps with my consistency, that then leads to results, results in more enthusiasm, more consistency, more results and enthusiasm and consistency and results. So it could be for anyone, any time of day that works for them, maybe for them, they've got their kids screaming that they got to drop them off to school, do it in <laughs> the, but then they've got their boss that they got to worry about. 
Do it in the car ride between the screaming kids and the screaming boss because that's your quiet time. Do it first thing in the morning before anyone else in your house gets up and they need you to make breakfast. Do it at the end of the night where everyone else has gone to sleep. Do it when it works for you where no one's in your way and you could just enjoy that moment as purely and intimately as possible. Yeah. And like you said earlier, the biggest part I think to that too is do it where it's enjoyable if you can, right? Because you got to yes. look forward to it and you're going to be in an altered state of, of happiness if you're enjoying it versus you know, the, the mentality back in the day of when you didn't want to do something was like waking up and like, it's time to make the donuts. Like there's like a famous Dunkin' Donuts commercial back in the day with Fred, the donut maker. Like he's like, Oh, time to make the donuts. Like you're not going to want to do it if you feel that way. And eventually you're going to, the habit will never become realized because it's stressful. It sucks. It's not fun. And so if you can do something that's a little bit more enjoyable, I've found at least in my own experience, it makes the habit become more, uh, it'll stick. Um, you know, as far as thinking about, your experience and 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 coming from this learning of law of attraction initially like the secret mm -hmm. and then jumping into your own learning and your own engineering of you know the law of attraction the last one you'll ever need to read what was the shift for you there did you basically like a good comedian and you, you alluded to this earlier just talking you know and i may be thinking about another conversation i was having basically trimming the fat, so to speak, instead of just like, you know, having all this stuff to do, like just trying to simplify it. Like what was your mentality to go from the secret to kind of the last law of attraction book you'll ever have? Yeah. So, and, and keep in mind, it, it wasn't just a secret or like, I read like so many law of attraction books. Yep. And the interesting thing about these law of attraction books, some of which by the way, were excellent. Well, yep. you know, a few of which were excellent. Most of which were just regurgitations of one another. It's very interesting. And, and here's the thing. Um, Maybe I'm just egotistical, but I do view myself as a good writer, and meaning I have a recognition of whether something is actually going to teach and communicate to someone versus not. And honestly, I don't see myself as as good a speaker, but as a writer in terms of crafting, like I'm really good. And the reason I mention that is because it's very easy for me to detect when someone is writing a law of attraction book. And they're giving this advice, but it's not coming from intimate personal experience. Like a, a known experience, like something they've lived. Yeah, exactly. No, they they heard someone else say it and they, they think it belongs in their law of attraction book and they want to sound smart rather than being useful. So for me, what this all came down to was like, okay, trying to reverse engineer and look at the 5,000 things that I tried related to law of attraction and narrow down like what worked for me and yep. why did it work for me? Yep. What didn't work for me and why didn't it work for me and making decisions based on that so that I can actually go about it in a stream. Like, I don't know if I ever said trimming the fat, but I certainly would say like, you know, streamlining yeah. and only worrying about what's useful. Like for me, so for example, the last law of attraction book you'll ever need to read does not go into quantum mechanics, not because quantum mechanics are not valuable right. and not because they're not important, but because for the purposes of implementing what I teach it wasn't a necessary part of the book. Yep. We so I this, left yeah. it out. Yep. What I did though, is like, I explained, well, why or how do we get out of our way in our own way? What can we do about that? And now that you understand that, here's some user-friendly methods that you can do in conjunction with it. That was yep. kind of like the approach because again, it was supposed to be not the last law of attraction book you'll ever read. That's up to you. It was supposed to be the last law of attraction book you'll ever need to read. Meaning it's the thing that finally gets you to do this with enough consistency, enthusiasm to get a result for yourself. And then you're not learning from me. You're not learning from my book. You're not learning from the universe. You're learning from your own personal experience. And yep. like you were kind of alluding to Jesse, once you experience something personally, nobody can ever take that away from you. And yep. that's the goal of this book. Yeah, that's it's a it's a powerful truth. It's it's when you have this learned experience and something that you've been through. And, I, and I, the analogy I usually use is like being back in the military and, and having shared experiences, whether you go into battle together, if you have these, these hard events that you, you have to grow through together. And this could be relationships too. It could be, it could be marriages. It could be friendships. It could be business partnerships. As soon as you have these experiences where you've basically overcome some shit and you're, you're a little bit stronger for it, a little bit more wise, maybe a little more empathetic because of it, it really puts you in a place of of un, at least understanding versus like you said, like someone who's read it somewhere and then just tried to like put it into their thing. And like, oh yeah, by the way, you can you can feel it. You can tell it. There's a different energy. Go, going back to energy, when someone's done this before, whatever this is, you can really sense and feel and your gut will kind of tell you, yeah, they kind of know what they're talking about. Like, I feel like yeah. I can learn something from this person. So speaking about learning something to, to you, 
I feel like, you know, what you're saying, you've, you've done a lot of this, this work yourself, but you know, you really can't go through life alone. So who are some of your personal mentors, people that you've learned from afar through podcasts, through books that have helped you to take you down this journey that you're on? So, cause well, there's two pieces that like there's the law of attraction part and the business part. Yeah. So from like a law of attraction standpoint, um, like one author that I like gets really connected with me wasn't even a law of attraction author. He's um his name was Shad Helmstetter, and he wrote a book called What to Say When You Talk to Yourself, which oh, really beautiful. just gave me an understanding of just you know the subconscious mind. It didn't really go into law of attraction. And of course, I read Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich, but also you know I read so many law of attraction books, and and it was like one big you know collage of information. I couldn't like go in that way. It's it's more like I just kind of like fought my way through and, and and ran into walls in the dark or whatever it might be. From a business standpoint, um, two names that really pop out is like one, Eben Pagan, who I don't know if people, how many people know his name, but he's a brilliant, brilliant marketer. And he really, the thing I loved about Eben is he understood just like me, hopefully the power and the importance of human psychology, yep. but he also understood the importance of improving yourself because it's from that part, from your understanding of your human psychology and from your willingness to improve yourself and go on that higher level that you have just so much more leverage in the decisions that you make business or relationship or, or anything else. Um, I was also a huge um, fan of Todd McFarlane growing up and oh, hell yeah. I don't know if people know Todd McFarlane, but if you believe Google, he's worth a third of a billion dollars and he was one of the image comics founders. And I didn't he was know a that. Comic he's book. worth that much money. According to Google, like, I don't know if I believe it, but that's wow. what Google says. It's a lot of and, spawn um, comic books. <laughs> yeah. And, and here's the thing that's Todd, like you're right. Spawn comic books. He was a comic book artist. Right. But what I understood that most people didn't is that he wasn't a comic book artist who went into business. He was an entrepreneur, a true entrepreneur who happened to draw comic books, yep. meaning everything you do. And I remember I was following him back when like, I was 12 years old. Right. You could tell that he understood his market. He understood what excited them he understood how to how to get his stuff out into the space like and and I'll, I'll never forget in college i did like a report on him where i i like i said here's what he's done so far in the new toy company that he'd launched and here's what he's going to do um over the next year and my professor gave me a b minus and Oof. i'm like why'd you give me a b minus he's like, well, because he goes because these are predictions that you made are ridiculous there's no way he's going to do that wow but I was right. And Todd did do all those things I predict because I had been studying him and I saw he was a visionary and I saw yeah. that he was going to make those moves. Whereas this professor was kind of stuck in his own bubble and he didn't understand it. So Todd really inspires me because the, the, the stuff he's come up with, he really understands people. He understands himself. He understands his strengths and he melds them all together very well. Did you hear that he was putting together like a horror updated version of Spawn? Like it was supposed to be more of like, yeah. And then like, it's gotten pushed back a little bit, but I, have you heard any, uh, have you heard about that? Yeah. I, I, um, I got to interview him a couple of years ago, like maybe two years ago. And like, I think the thing is he's, he, he did the one movie back in 1997 and he, I'm sure stuff he loved and stuff he hated. Yeah. I think part of the problem with the movie is he's really trying to do a lot of it himself and his own independent financiers. So there, there's a lot more stumbling blocks, but I know that, Jamie Foxx was attached to it and he might probably still will be. And I don't know how long it's going to take Todd, but I guarantee you that when this one comes out, it's going to make a bigger dent, a way bigger dent than the one that he did back in 97. Yeah. yeah there's, there's something uh, really powerful about people that really want to see their dream come to life and they want to see something that's so moving for them, you know, move the world. And so there's always, I think there's more of a gravity to those types of things, right. Versus just make a quick buck. And there's a market for that. But at the end of the day, you could tell this guy like lives it, breathes it, eats it. He's, he's, he's inspired so many. And, you know, there's just, there's a really uh, interesting opportunity there for, for, for that. And then the second piece is, are you a comic book fan outside of Tom McFar Todd McFarlane? So back in the day, I I wanted to draw comic books. Yeah. So back, like these days, I I don't read so many comic books. I mean, you know, I watch the the MCU movies, or at least you know, I think they kind of got pretty shitty. But you know, up until <laughs> Endgame, I thought they were pretty good. Um. So, but back in the day, I actually wanted to be a comic book artist. Then I really I I sucked. So I was like, I'll be a comic strip artist. That didn't work out. <laughs> but um. But yeah, I, I used to like read books back in the day. And again, I just I, I was a huge fan of of Todd's art. Like it just it spoke to me. It, it just yep. popped off the page. Yep. Um. But then based on that, I just happened to follow him. And but uh, I also you know I remember all the image stuff. And I remember like I I collected back in the nineties. Like you know right. Infinity Gauntlet when that that wasn't like a Marvel movie. That right. was a comic book. And That's Jim Lee yeah. and all that yeah. stuff. I uh, 
I have about 8,000 comics and a few, probably about a hundred action figures I've acquired through the years. And, uh, the idea and a big, a big portion of it was a buddy of mine who was offloading like a majority of his, his, uh, collection. And I had been, a I the same, I, I, I used to draw, I still do. I do painting now. Um, I'll show you, I'll send you a picture of this Spider-Man venom kind of crossover that I did that I painted. It's really cool. It's like half spider-man half venom and like the the symbiotes bleeding over into spider-man's face and it's just like the duality of life the good versus the bad the light versus the dark and uh, it's just really cool and like so like just these getting back to what made me happy as a child has been on my mind for the last couple of years and and that was one of the things and i remember going growing up through grade school like i would obviously not be paying attention and i would just be drawing sketching doodling writing like graffiti and like we actually used to in boston we used to run around the city and like tag and do all sorts of stuff but it's it's it was a it was a it was a fun time it was a carefree time and i just remember the escapism of like thinking about what it would like to be the hulk or wolverine or punisher or some of these 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 characters that i was really into and it's uh, it's interesting that that stuff never really goes away and and how that stuff has made a huge, huge comeback, especially with the MCU and some of the things that are out there. So it's just really always interesting to hear people's experience with that. Yeah, man. And that's good. Dude, I, I'll definitely want to check out that drawing. That sounds really, really I'll awesome. I'll send you dude. a picture of it for sure. Um, but uh, so jumping back to you and to what, to what you've experienced with this calling, right? It seems like this has really been a, a huge part of your life's work. And so, so where has it taken you? So, so from going, uh, you know, I'm going to write my first book to actually getting it done to where you are now and like where the, the kind of the trajectory is heading. Like what are some of the things that's brought into your life? What are some of the, the wins, the losses or, or the highs, the lows, like kind of give us a little bit of the narrative of that journey. Yeah. Well, it sounds so cliche because it's like, you know, the dream. Um, but I'm finally right now, at least at a point where I, Rick, I just enjoy what I do in my day. Like maybe today I'll record a YouTube video for the book, or maybe I won't. I get to chat with Jesse in the afternoon, but you know, after that I can either work or not. Like there's, there's a lot of um, flexibility and freedom right now that I've, that I've been able to enjoy. Um, But this, you know, the last little attraction book you'll ever need to read technically wasn't my first book. It was because like I've had failures in the past. So I, you know, I wrote other books synonymously and, you know, I learned things. I'm like, okay, I tried things. Nothing like no law of attraction stuff. I did a yep. meditation book, yep. but, um, but yeah, what, like the stuff that's really brought me from, from the positive end is like that feeling of freedom. But by that same token, um, like, it's just like everybody else, you know, there's, there's things that piss me off. There's things that stress me out. Like, you know, no one's, at least in my experience is immune to the stresses of life. You know, like I've been following Alex for and like that dude right now, I mean, he's worth, you know, over a hundred million dollars. He's got all this stuff going on and he doesn't bitch and moan. I guarantee you there's, a, you know, as much as he's worked on his mindset, there's, there's probably things that really ruin his day. Sometimes there's a no lot question. of stress. You'll never know. So, you know, he's worth, you know, a hundred million dollars. I'm not worth quite that much yet. Technically on paper, I'll, I'm looking forward to that moment. Uh-huh. But I, I mean, for me, I just have the same stresses as everyone else. Yep. You know, when there's a, when there's a tech issue or there's a problem with, you know, um, you know, with it, with shipping a book, like, like just normal stuff. It's like the minutia of always wanting to be on top of everything and resisting the temptation for my perfectionism. Like, because like if, if a customer emails me and they're having an issue, even if it's not my fault, I tend to naturally put that like burden and weight on my shoulders and I'm just uncomfortable until it's been resolved for them. It's just yeah. me. Which, so, is, which is a good thing because it helps you to keep your clients first and like what they say, think and do matters. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I wish I can be like a little more carefree about the whole thing. But listen, we are on an endless journey, whether you live to 50 or 100 or 150. Mm. I guarantee you, everyone out there, there's always going to be something about yourself that you're going to be working on that you're wishing could be better. And the key to a happy life is, in my view, is finding a way of always reaching for that while simultaneously always being content with the progress you've made thus far and not allowing your need for the improvement to prevent you from enjoying the present moment. That's it. It's all about being present, being grateful in the moment. I mean, great gratitude, daily gratitude and a daily presence is, is really one of the best ways to do life. Um, and it, it's, I talk about this a lot with many people and it's, it's, it's too profound, you know, really kind of values in a sense of, of how to do life and, and how to show up powerfully for yourself and those around you and how to be present. And cause it's cliche, the term, but the present is all we have. It's absolutely mm-hmm. a gift. Like we lived yesterday if we're here today and, but it's gone, you can't go back. And, and if you look to the future, that's great to have goals and to have dreams, but you're not there yet. So you really only have right here and right now. 
And what causes 90 plus percent of anxiety, I'd even probably go even further than that, is trying to not be in the present moment and worrying about what you did 10 years ago when you screwed up or worrying about something that's going to happen tomorrow that may never even happen. Being present really takes takes that into perspective and it really kind of eliminates a lot of a lot of those 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 things. Um, so what, what else you have going on outside of the book? And, and forgive me if I, if I, if I didn't hear you here, but what, what does the day to day look like? What is the, you know, how are you serving your clients and, and, and what are some of the things you have going on in your world? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting these days cause I, I used to have clients and you know, I'm available for people, but I don't like, I have more customers and clients these days. Like okay. I really have the law of attraction book and what I'm doing has been so fulfilling, fortunately that I've intentionally structured my day around it. Meaning. Um, the priorities on making YouTube content, the priorities doing interviews for both books, things of that nature. The funny thing about three words, I used to sell a hundred thousand books. One of the things I was doing that I actually teach in that book is when the law of attraction book, like would hit a sales milestone, I would announce it not to brag, but with the understanding that, you know, people want to get into a party that looks popular. So <laughs> if it sold 40,000 copies or 50,000 copies or 70,000 copies, I'm going to post that so that people like, Hey, maybe, maybe now I should check this thing out. But my friends also saw me doing this, right? So they're like, Andrew, how the hell are you selling all these books? <laughs> so now, Jesse, I'm getting on these calls for free with these people, and I'm more than happy to do it. But I mean, I'm having all this conversation like, you know what? Let me just write a book for this. And notice, again, I'm giving myself permission. I'm, I'm so deeply embedded in the law of attraction niche. But I'm like, you know what? No, I'm going to do a marketing book. That has nothing to do with it. I'm going to give myself permission. I don't care personally. Maybe I'm not the best entrepreneur here. I don't care about diluting my brand name and, and diverting the name Andrew Cap from Law of Attraction. I put this book out. I'm like, fine, let me. And who knows what, what book I'll write next? But but yeah, these days, while most of the energy and attention is still in the Law of Attraction book, yes. I'm like quietly working on, on workshops and stuff where I teach more from few words I used to sell 100,000 books, like, you know, how to construct a book cover that people are actually going to respond to. And, yep. and a little, and by the way, I'm happy to give away the secret. Like the one thing that most people don't think to do that if they did, they'd sell a lot more copies because a lot more people would notice them, but also how to title your book, how to market, like how to do things in a way where if you don't have the support of a major publisher, you can still get a lot of leverage yes. and a lot of bang for your own buck. And by the way, when I say buck, I mean for free, because a lot of this can be done organically without spending a dime which is huge right there's so many people that, that you know there's there's this uh, idea that everybody has at least one book in them whether it's their life story their experiences their zone of genius their you know their talent um and there's a lot of people that want to write a book and they feel yeah. like the barrier to entry whether it's not having the right information the funds the connections the the know-how it's really not as hard as people think and yes it does take skill and technique and not to not to dumb it down but I have uh, a good buddy of mine. You probably heard this name, Mark Victor Hansen. He's he wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. He's also in the Guinness Book of World Records for for having like the most books sold by an author, I think, outside of the Bible. And he mm. talks he talks about you know some of these insights, and and it really just comes down to when you decide you want to do it, like going through the process. It's like anything else. Just just it sounds super easy, but it's just finish what you started. And the the there what you go touching back on what you said was really important. I think. There's so much that really goes into this whole idea of being an author and, and selling books. Like even when you're talking about the cover of your book, looking at it right now on the screen, there's a lot of psychology, even in colors. And this is something yes. I learned through the years too. Like blue is used to be calm and it's, 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 uh, you know, trustworthy. And then you have orange is like energetic and vibrant. Like it, it like creates colors will create different emotions. Red will create, it's like, it's a, it's a power color and it speaks to certain types of people. And there's all different things that go into it. And so I think that, just a having the the calling to say I do want to write a book, and then b just going through the process and finding someone like yourself or other people that have these insights that can really share to people's journey, and and I would even just speak really quickly to mine. I had a book that I was writing, and I've since stopped because it just doesn't make sense anymore. But I was halfway through a book called uh, Happy Wealth, and Happy Wealth was part autobiography, part uh, financial planning on how to create a life you want today. And also enjoy that life, you know, through retirement. And it was all of these financial planning concepts. It was, you know, inspirational, these, these life stories. And then one day I just realized, I was like, 
I don't want to be a financial planner anymore. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't even want to talk about this anymore. And I think that's also important too, is like you are, you talked about this a couple of times, being authentic and true to yourself and not like, you know, I'm, I'm over here. So that, that means I can't go over here in terms of what I speak about or how I help people. For me, it was like, I don't want to talk about this shit anymore. I could care less about this. And I don't want to be out here just to make a buck living in alignment with who you are in the moment is just as powerful. I think. Yeah, man, I couldn't agree more. And, and just to really, you know, to, to sneak in a little, hopefully value for people, anyone listening, whether you are a nonfiction author or just an entrepreneur, you want to sell something. One thing that I teach in three words that you sell hundred thousand books, I call it the Amazon squint test. And basically it's the understanding again, human psychology, right? Whether you've hired someone to make your book cover or your info product cover or whatever cover for you, or you're like, you know, a control freak like me and you're doing it yourself. Um, there is an inherent, you know, um, motivation and desire to to look at the cover in its best possible light because you're actually subconsciously trying to sell it even as you're designing it. Yep. So when you're looking at the cover, you've got it really large on the screen, blown up, where you see every little micro detail. But what I would encourage people to do is to reduce it, to reduce the book size to a smaller pixel, like how it appear as a recommended book on Amazon and someone else's listing. And then ask yourself, do I need to squint to read the title? Because if someone, if you have to struggle to read the title, no matter how fancy your cover is, that means when someone's browsing on Amazon or browsing wherever you're, you've got your info product or book, they're going to have that same trouble. It's about use like, you know, simple human psychology and strategy, make it easy for them to read. And you so understand I, this. <laughs> yeah. So I always make sure like, <laughs> if if I have to squint for even a second in order to read the title, that means I've got to redo something with this cover. Otherwise, it's not doing the thing that it's intended to do, which is to sell the book. And I see that looking at your two different. Have you written two books now? Yeah, well, under under Andrew Cap, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Synonymously, so, again, I had to learn these things the hard way, but yeah, like these are the books. These are really the only books that are available for me now. So, so under under Andrew Cap, these two books that are behind you, uh, the mm-hmm. last law of attraction book you'll ever need to read, and then the three words I used to sell hundred thousand books. There's some obvious choices that you've made there, and like the size of font and and and, and coloration. And I'm sure it just ties back to what you're saying, like the the Amazon squint test. Can I read? Yes. Can I? Because it's communication. You this is this is your genius as, as as a marketer, as a copywriter, someone that knows how to convey a message to people. The first thing is, do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, and that's a big part of it. Yeah, and and one little quick little thing here again, like I'm a nonfiction author. One thing I think again, sometimes you know, authors they want to they always want to look good. They want to sell books. And they want to make money, but they also want to look good to their friends and family meaning they want their title to sound cool. I'm a huge proponent of my book title sounding useful and of being very intentional about answering the question to the reader of what's in it for me if yeah. I read this book. Yep. Um, and I, in, in, in the book, I, I throw a little shade at Andy for Silla in, in like lovingly because <laughs> like that guy's got way more followers than me and more power to him. Yeah. And by the way, the reason that I can throw shade and he can do this thing that I'm throwing shade about is because he's got the, the success and he's got the know-how and he's got the followers. But the the 75 hard, no one knows what that means just by the title itself. They only know it because it's such a kick-ass program and right. a kick-ass plan and word of mouth. That's why it does well. But if you're not Andy Frisilla and you don't have millions of followers or a successful podcast or any of that, you need to have a book title on your book where if people are scrolling through a certain solution on Amazon, mm-hmm. your title tells them what it is. Otherwise, they're not going to open it. They're not going to check it out. Yep. There's there's this idea. And I was learning this through my pro, pro, like process of writing a book. There, and there's multiple things, but the two big things I learned is like a book title. It could be, it could jump out, the, like you said, useful or utilization or inspiration. Like there's a couple of different ways to really kind of like grab people's attention if that's you know, obviously what you're trying to do. And so- it's uh, it's funny you bring up Andy Frisella. I did seventy five hard. Have you had have you had the experience of doing that? I bought it, but I haven't started yet. <laughs> <laughs> I did I did the challenge, and I got through twenty two days, and it was actually pretty. Uh, it's more mental than anything. The physical yes. part's not nearly as hard as the mental. And and the thing that got me was the physical reading. I uh, I woke up the next day to start day twenty three. And I realized that I hadn't turned the page from like two days before when like I didn't do the reading. And I was like, oh, shit, I forgot mm-hmm. to read the night before I'm done. And like, it's all about integrity. Like what you do when no one watches is what will define you as a human being. And I was like, shit, I could just keep going because it was just a reading. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I can't. So I stopped at day 22 going into day 23. My buddy, I was doing it with another like you talk about accountability buddy, uh, good buddy of mine, Dr. David. He's uh, he got to like maybe day 50. 
and then he he faltered but it's it's just the habits and it's just you know the little things but like it's it's holding yourself accountable and what it does for a lot of people is it it kind of gives them a clean slate to kind of start anew um and so yeah. I, I would highly recommend it to anybody who wants it because i'm a I like pushing the body, pushing the mind. And uh, anybody who wants to try it, I would say give it a shot. Am I a fan of Andy Frisella personally? No, but I like the idea of uh, of, of what that can do for people. Yeah. And and by the way, Jesse, you just you said something so important that people you're not let, like whatever your opinion of Andy Frisella is, you're not letting that stop you from taking value that he's offering. And I think there's there, there's sometimes people there'll be a book or a person something they don't like about the person. And they write them off. I'm like, listen, can you glean value from something? Even that someone that you don't like is putting out there because that's that's a difference maker. That's how you know if you're really open minded and if you're really interested in furthering yourself in your life. It's a really important standard to keep track of. I've, I've been going through this, this uh, a new a new development or a growth period for me where two things to that point, you know, can you agree to disagree and can you learn from someone that you may not like or is someone that has a great point? Right. Someone that has some great experience. Can you be open minded enough, you know, less egotistical enough to say, you know what, I don't like what they're doing, but they have a great point. That's the first part. And this, like what you were just saying, the second part is uh, I don't know if you know who Jordan Peterson is, but uh, yeah, Jordan Peterson is a very profound, profound thought leader of our time. And again, divisive, if, if you know, he might not like some of his stances and, and certain things, but he is absolutely a philosopher for our day and age. And, um, He's got me really thinking. And I was thinking about this this morning. You know, am I really a free thinker? Because I pr- I pride myself on on this, you know, stoic Spartan. You know, uh, some of my heritage comes from there. Like these philosophers, thinking that I'm a free thinker. But like, I feel like a lot of information that I have is is gleaned from somewhere else. And is that really my true thought? Is that how I truly feel? And so I'm going through this really se- really interesting season of life where I'm starting to like analyze, am I really a free thinker? So it's, it kind of ties into what we were just talking about is being able to, you know, take somebody else that you disagree with. If their information seems better, more useful, taking that, even if you don't like that person at the same time, is that like your own feeling, your own thought about it? So it's just a weird change that I'm going through. Yeah. And you know, this is just like my personal opinion, but I think the closest anyone can get to being a free thinker is having the recognition and accepting the recognition that possibly the majority of their views were handed to them by somebody else in t- whether either intentionally or unintentionally you know in a way that it's it's just the course of life yep meaning yep. that you know there's there's so much like it's basically the the mental and emotional stress of carrying the uncertainty of even the things that you're certain about 100% 100% i think you know it's just a, another part of the evolution uh and just my my Remembering who I am and, 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 uh, you know, knowing a little bit more in detail about, you know, what my purpose is here on earth, which I have a good idea, but just, it's always an evolution. Like you said, you live 50 years, hundred years, 150 years, there's always something to learn and to grow. Uh, but being happy with the journey is the secret sauce. Like the journey is the prize. You can have goals, you can have dreams, but if you don't live until you've realized the new house or you don't live until you realize a new relationship, you've just wasted all the time getting there. And it's yeah. really the, the learning of the journey. The journey's the prize, right? Um, so so in speaking of just kind of going back to some of the things that you do to to optimize your you talked about your health and wellness, you talked about relationships and business. What are some of your daily habits outside of the the mindset piece that are really kind of keeping you on your A game? So for me, there there isn't a lot because again, I have a recognition where if there's too much, I'm I'm gonna like fall off. So the the one there's only one non-negotiable technically. The one non-negotiable is that thing that I do with uh, with my friend back and forth. Yep. Um but I you know I try and I'm usually good about like you know making a shake every day with all these different supplements. Yep. Um what I What do you throw in your wh- shake? What do you what do you put in there? Um I put wow, what do I put in there? Um I put magnesium in there. I yep. put um, this thing called like like al- like all these um, mixers. I bought this thing called like alkaline greens and ruby yeah. reds. Yeah. Like all the the crushed greens, all the crushed reds. Um, oh, I put um, dandelion root. I put cacao in there. Oh, yeah. like, bro, let's talk about cacao for a second. So um, yeah, man, I can I can give you a cup of uh, ceremonial gray cacao, just raw chocolate, and it'll friggin' change your life. <laughs> Dude, what, dude? Let me know, man. I'll give you my address. Like, whatever works. It'll, man. it'll change your life, brother. Like these, there's some gift from, gifts from the gods. Like, it doesn't have to be plant medicines. It could be a, a raw form of chocolate, 
that some of these Toltec, Aztec, uh, there's these powerful like lineages and in, in, in these kingdoms, some of their kings and 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 royalty used to drink this stuff all day every day. And it's so much. It, it, it's it's incredible. So I, I like that you use cacao and 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 you're you're giving your body the nutrients it needs so that you can be useful and you can be present. And so what else? What else on top of that? Um, and and by the way, the reason I have trouble memorizing is because like I'm I'm like crazy. I have like 50 supplements at once. Um, <laughs> so like because I just I you know I, I put um like um powdered beets. Yeah. Um. So so I put beets in there. Um. What else? It's weird and like but there's a bunch of stuff where like you know I've I've I remember getting like an um not an infomercial but like uh <laughs> something in the mail like selling me on something so yeah, like yeah. you know stuff for 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 a healthy heart circulation. Yep um you know stuff for for your brain like just a whole random mix um something root oh um see this is it's a funny thing like i i forgot all this stuff i just like, no you but know, that's that's a, that's a cocktail and that you're setting the intention daily of doing something healthy that'll invigorate you something that'll bring health into your life because at the end of the day health is wealth you know and, and i used to be a financial yeah. planner and i'll tell you Unless they're just crazy, most clients that I had would absolutely pay every dime they had to stay healthy if they had some sort of serious illness they were facing. You know, if, if it's the money or if it's my life, I can always make the money back, but I can't necessarily like pick, you get my health back. And so it's it's important that you're healthy. And in, in that vein, it looks like you're in shape. Do you have like any movement practices that you stick to throughout the week? Or thanks. Um, I was doing yoga actually for a while, Hell and yeah. I, I still have DDP yoga. So here's Heck the funny yeah. thing: he's here in Georgia, right down the street from me in Smyrna, Georgia. He lives right down the street, so I've seen I've seen his his like location. I've seen him around town. It's pretty funny. It's by the way, like if, if it's kind of like close to your cup of tea, highly recommended. Um, I actually <laughs> from February until May, I I hired someone. We're over Zoom. He he worked me through uh through yoga. Yeah, and um, then it got to a point where like all my work was getting so busy. That uh, that I'd stopped, but like for that while, like I got like in tremendous shape, and oh, yeah. um, I have a plan actually starting in about three weeks to kind of close out the year. Yeah, um, I want to do some form of heavy lifting because I think Heck yeah, my like there's some my research like there's something about you know as men putting your muscles under that like lifting heavy weights. No question that will really trigger a lot of things and get things going. So I'm looking forward to just going through some kind of simulated weightlifting motion, even yep. if I'm not actually in a gym, even if I'm not actually doing free weights. Yep. No, it's beautiful. Again, back to the Stoic Socrates, uh, and I forget the exact quote, but he was like, it is every citizen's duty to know the the beauty of their body in the sense of like fitness. Like what is your body capable of? What, what, like you won't fully live or know who you are until you know what your body's capable of. And you're going through these seasons right now, which is really beautiful. You're putting yourself against the test, right? And you're, you're trying to see what your body, mind, and soul is, 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 is uh, capable of. So I think that's beautiful. And, and again, it's a life well lived, like moving your body, eating well, you know, challenge yourself mentally, you know, doing these things, these hard things. I mean, it's better than the alternative. And, and, and it seems like you're really thriving, which is great. So in in this vein of kind of thinking about the future, what is it that you're looking forward to? Like, what in terms of bucket list or accomplishing or just enjoying life? Like, what what's the next you know ten, fifteen years, twenty years looking like for you? It, it's weird because I used to do like the five year plan and the ten year plan, yeah, yeah. and I see the value in it. Yeah. But by that same token, I'm very open ended. Like, so I have this thing. Like, you know, I've sold a hundred thousand copies of the book. I want to hit a million. Okay. Just you know, just because once I do that, then I can go off of that because that's such a big number it will propel me and keep me on point serving people and and getting things done so i want to sell a million copies of, of the law of attraction book and hell you know i'll take a million copies of the three words book also um <laughs> but beyond that i i'm actually i'm trying to be very open ended and we we kind of like said we we were almost like saying it like you know reading between the lines before we hit the record button we're in a very strange place in this world and a very strange you know level of its evolution I don't know what the world is going to look like in 15 years. So right. <laughs> there's like, you know, it's like <laughs> I like basically I'm wrestling with a certain level of, of uncertainty of how the world's going we to unfold. Yeah. Um, so there's a combination that is trying to have like this open endedness. And, and by the way, I don't technically recommend an open ended attitude. Yeah. I'm only doing it because it, it's working and resonating for me right now. But I would definitely recommend people if they haven't done it yet, do the five or 10 year plan because it does produce results. For me, I've kind of done that. So now I'm this this new level of evolution where we're just seeing where things go and we're seeing where I'm inspired. Like I didn't say I'm going to it's time to write a new book. It's like, oh, like, 
like it just like I have to write a book. Like it, it occurred to me to write this new book. Yeah. And when it's time to write another book, and I've got a couple of ideas already, I'll do that. When it's time to do a new YouTube channel, when it's time to do anything, like I'm like of this attitude and this mindset that like when the time comes, I will know what to do. And I'm trying to be very responsible and very diligent in following my gut and my intuition, because the more I do that, the better I get at doing that. And then the better I get at doing that, the more powerful I am in terms of my decisions, in terms of my intention and in terms of my results. That's beautiful, brother. I love it. And, uh, you know, it is an interesting time. And, and I've always been a, a glass half full kind of guy. I've seen a lot of crazy shit in my life that's given me a lot of perspective for gratitude. And there's two schools of thought and they could be concurrent. There's the idea that we're in the great reset and there's this technocracy that's booming and, you know, we're going to be us versus them and it's going to be really bad. And that's happening. You know, you can actually check out like World, World Economic Forum and they're meeting at Davos and they actually have this as an agenda. So like it's happening. But then there's also this idea that we're in the great change. And because of this intense push towards control, it's 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 like liberating people and, and we're becoming more powerful. And so to your to your point, who knows where the hell we're going to be, right? 10, 15 years from now. But at the end of the day, it goes back to gratitude and presence and and being grateful for the day that you have today, being powerfully present and then showing up the best way you can. So in that vein, I want to say thank you for showing up powerfully today, Andrew. And 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 very uh over overall, we touched on multiple subjects, but very powerful in each. Um, very detailed, very free of 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 information. I think it was really important to kind of hear a little bit more context of of kind of what what was the impetus for you and and how you were able to utilize this for yourself and then teach other people how to do it. So from the first viewer and listener of this episode, I just want to say thank you for being you, brother. Jesse, thank you so much for having me. And, you know, I remember when I said at the beginning, I'm looking forward to this conversation. This is exactly why. I really appreciate the intentionality that you put me through in this conversation. And I really appreciate your audience. And I'm really hoping that I gave them value today. You're the man, Andrew. You are the man. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for being on the Jesse T Show, brother. Thank you, sir. Thank you.